Can't go past the Buick Roadmaster. It's called a waterfall grill, for obvious reasons. This is a 50. All right, so the fins are not that tall. I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess the year. I would say a 55 maybe with the lower fins Roadmaster but it's got all that chrome and the Buick Roadmaster would never have high fins so with all that chrome it's probably later 50s maybe 57 56 Ooh, 54 it should have gone the other way it was close the first time around so in the 50s GM decided that there was a car for every class, whether it be you know Chevrolet or Pontiac or Oldsmobile or Buick or Cadillac. Uh, every economic, socioeconomic sphere had their own car aimed at them. And during the 50s, they came out with a new model every year. So you would go look at your neighbor washing his car, and you'd know that his car was two years old. And that would sort of drive them to want to buy a new car because it would be like driving around your car with the year written on it. So, Tri-Power. Is that a Pontiac? Pontiac Parasane, Tri-Power, 389, three deuces. So this is called a Tri-Power Pontiac Parasane convertible. It had three carburetors, three two-barrel carburetors, tri-power. This is the apex of ostentatious American automobiles. This is the 1959 Cadillac Eldorado convertible. It's an Eldorado BRX2, which is their class pack. So you can see these fins these phenomenally tall fins that come up to the bottom of my chest. This massive living room you've got in your back seat. Oh, and he's got air switches on it. That's why it's so low. You can raise and lower it. Oh my god. This guy is hitting switches in his 59 Cadillac Eldorado Biarritz. How on earth did he manage to squander so much of other people? This is other people's money. I just see all fans of new cars don't think that I'm not, you know, that I, you know, I don't want y'all to think I'm too impartial. This is a Challenger Demon. It's, I don't know, insane seven, eight hundred horsepower. It's basically a race car for the road. 840 horsepower. Get the Oh, but it's also got a screen. You can see what you're doing. So it's got a back seat, which I thought a lot of them did not. I don't see a roll bar in them. So that demon. So this is, it's kind of odd that that would be next to a gold DeSoto and a 59 Cadillac. And then you've got the Dodge Demon with the matte black hood. So this is, these are, these are really rare too. These are the uh, Yellowstone tour buses. Uh, these always go for really big money and they don't come up for sale very often. Just a massive four wheel drive touring vehicle. It's got some cool stuff too, like these chairs and all. This is a tuk-tuk. When you go to Indonesia, some of the, uh, Vietnam, some of the Asian countries there, South Asian, you have these tuk-tuks where you ride in the back, your driver. This is a pretty big one. This is a massive tuk-tuk, actually. So the driver rides you around. This is an automatic. This is like brand new. This isn't like a traditional tuk-tuk. So see that unique car over there with the headlights in the middle? It's an Arnold Bristol. One for sale in Phoenix right now. They're really good looking cars. Kind of take a little getting used to. There you go. Arnold Bristol. 
It's a 1920 locomobile. I just want to point out something interesting. That's where the hand crank used to be. It's been converted over to a more modern drive. Probably years and years ago. But uh, it would have had a hand crank back in the day. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's a 12-volt battery, so that's newer. Tufted interior. Oh, my God. So I just realized I've been walking around this car several times, and it's a, it's a 225 Ferrari, which is the old, old racing Ferraris, before the, obviously before the 250 series. But this is an old Ferrari. Oh, oh. Oh, oh my God, look at this. I want to show you the button. All right, so you push this button, the handle pops out, and you pull the handle. All right, so close it, push the handle, push the button, pop the door, it opens up. And you have nothing but old Ferrari goodness. Now, this is before the gated shifters, you see. Oh my god, this is with the custom luggage. I mean, this is the car you would take out to the country if you were so inclined in the day. My God. I think that I would take this Ferrari over most any other car here. I'm over most cars here. I like a more primal driving experience. Don't get me wrong. Testarossa is nice, but, you know, and this is the DB5, by the way, where it, before I called the DB6 the DB5. And then I'm laughing about it because only I think that that's funny. It's that little Alpine Renault. It's just such an incredible little car. Just, but you really don't get a hold of I, I really just could never imagine how small they are until I had seen this one here. I just, I just didn't realize how small they were. But they are very small cars. And muscular. But very small so people are very polite today I don't know if it's COVID or what but nobody's walking in front of anybody's picture everybody's giving everybody time and space it's really nobody's mocking my walking around narrating to myself uh, it's a really really great crowd I did see a guy with no mask on don't be that guy just, just don't be let's not pretend we're not in a global pandemic and I know a lot of people say, well, it's my right not to wear one. It's not your right to get me sick. And when you walk around, you're raising the risk against me. Put a mask on. You know, we're all suffering. Can you imagine our forebearers, our grandparents, went through a depression and World War II? That they didn't complain about rationing. If they did, they didn't whine about it on the internet. Anyway, soapbox of. Here we have a Hudson, but it was designed by touring super legera. It's a super light version of a Hudson. It's basically, this is a Hudson Italia, which is a pretty rare vehicle. It wasn't often that American cars went to Italian carrozzerias, but this one did. 55, so let's see if you, it's got the, Okay, so that handle was a little bit difficult. But you can see it's even it's still got the step down, so this would have been a hornet that somebody converted into an Italia. You've got the step down body, so this is the same kind of car that they were taking to the NASCAR. It's a hornet that uh, somebody at the Touring Superleggera has converted. So this, 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 this car This is a 40, what is this, a 48? But anyway, that would be donated to that more or less. Except this is an earlier car, this is maybe a 48. Interior of a Hudson. And you see you've got the step down interior that made these handles so well in NASCAR because the whole entire body was encased. 
There's something kind of cool. This is a Shelby GT350 Hertz. Hertz rental car. Used to get these back in the day. You see the paint scheme, the, the yellow and black. It's got the Hertz wheels. These are actually designed specifically for the Hertz rent a car company. So you would go into Hertz, you, see, you know, nowadays you can you can rent supercars. You get Shelby signature. I signed it and I put it upside down. But they would rent out these were supercars back in the day and you go into Hertz like I guess now you can go to Ferrari rental places rent a Ferrari and what have you but this uh, was the equivalent of that going for the weekend and rent a Shelby Mustang uh, 350 so it would have been the 289 right there it is, has been Shelby-fied Fomoco Ford Motor Company Here's the Scarab. I just Lance Reventlo, Revlon Cosmetics was his family. Lance Reventlo. He uh, designed the Scarab to race. He was a race car driver himself. He had the Scarab race team. This is a Mach 3 because it's got the left-hand drive. Shelby, Carol Shelby, bought out Reventlo's space in California, and this is this is basically the the this had a GM engine in it, I believe, but this was sort of Shelby before there was Shelby. This is the early 60s, late 50s, 58. So, incredible, incredible little car. It's a GM, but I'm pretty sure that, that Scarab used a GM. Uh, I don't think it was 320, but yeah, they used a, a 283, I believe, and he didn't make much of a go at it and sold out. Carol Shelby bought his factory. I don't know much about this guy's business ethics, but I really like that he's a Fiat and an Abarth guy. I mean, that's, excuse me, you just don't see that anymore. Uh, not, not Fiat and Abarth. Um, a lot of, obviously, Ferrari people and Lamborghini people, but he's even, he's, you know, he's got a, a, a Lancia, which is beautiful, but a Fiat Abarth person. I've, as I've gotten older, I've come to really respect that. the guy without a mask even outside just you know. so I'm looking at this Alpha Julieta convertible and I wanted to say this is why Italian cars are so beautiful so you've got the metal here the convertible top on the MG it sort of folds under and then you can feel the gap of the metal the edge of the metal on these Italian cars the metal just blends totally rolled over beautifully perfectly under the other side you can't feel the lip at all. It's just, it's literally just rolled steel. Just, just, it just feels smooth to the touch. It's like, like liquid. Buttery where you run into multiple surfaces. It's just an incredible feel in Italian, Italian metal work. You, you can't beat it. I mean, the Brits have nice, but they use that English wheel. Italians are hammering this out. And it's, you just can't beat it running down it's just oh it's phenomenal I'm gonna say about Italian cars is you know especially Alfa Romeo's it's you have to have these really long arms and short legs it's a very odd driving position I don't know maybe it's because I'm I've got some guinea in me but you know I do have a, have a, a, a stubby little legs and so I get in these little Italian cars and my arms are abnormally long sort of simian in nature so it feels natural to wrap myself around these cars like this is so incredible we have an auburn 8 speedster another supercharged american you know, like the cord auburn duesenberg it's glistening there 
sun just went behind a cloud. I wish I'd caught it a second earlier, but supercharged. See those exhaust piping through? Oh my God. Imagine back in the day, this was the car of the wealthy. This, all right, so see, So there, it came with a plaque that certifies this Auburn automobile has been driven 100.1 miles per hour before shipment. I'm gonna guarantee this is a 100 mile an hour automobile. I mean, that was balls. I and mean, that was incredible. This is 1935. Look at the metal work. Look at how everything grills up into the, look at the venting on the side. Those cream colored wheels and hubs. Just everything about this car is just beautiful. And then, there's something to be said for European cars, don't get me wrong. But when we got it right, we get it right. That's your job. So lest anybody think that I'm a bit of a car snob, this is a beautiful little Honda N600, 1970 as it says. Uh, the Honda, back then they had the uh, S600, as you've seen through a couple, that was sort of a, the coupe uh, and the uh, uh, convertible. The N, which was more of the, the, the commuter vehicle. The N was the series that everybody drove around. Then they had what was called the Z600 series, and they were a little bit curvier, a little bit more cut, a little bit more athletic, uh, but this is an early S600. There was one model before this in Honda's line. It was called the, the, uh, uh, the N360. Tiny, tiny little car. A uh, little uh, micro car, and, but this is the N600. This is the car that really made it for Honda. This and the Z600. They really paved the way for that Japanese reliability. This would have been a chain-driven car. Let's see if I can get a picture of that underneath there. Maybe not. There you go. There's that chain drive down under there. So kind of like a bike, like a motorcycle. Honda made motorcycles, so it stands to reason they would make a chain-driven first car.